12 o'clock and there's absolutely no reason to start late with a virtual presentation. So we are going to get going straight away. Um, thank you for joining me on this webinar. It's uh, the first one that I'm actually hosting myself. I've been on a ton of webinars uh, for other people, but I haven't actually done one on my own. So if there are any technical glitches, just bear with me. <laughs> so my name is Eric Kruger. I'm an executive coach, speaker, and author. Um, I have a master's degree in business and executive coaching from the University of the Witwatersrand, the Wits Business School. And for the past year and a half, um, I've really had a very special interest in working with teams. Um, and that's been in various different ways, whether it's been team coaching, team facilitation, uh, workshops, offsites, you name it. And I've really fallen in love with teams. I think it's, you know, it's ultimately the people that end up building your business, um, the people that support you during difficult times, like what we're going through at the moment. And so I'm really excited to share with you just some of the ideas around team building that I've been working on for the past year and a half. Um, give me one second. So I just, there's something wrong on this screen. There we go. So quickly, expectation management, just so we're all on the same page. Um, I'll be busy for about 15 minutes because I've seen when I've attended webinars that my attention span isn't that great. So I'm going to be going for 15 minutes. After the 15 minutes, we'll take a quick break for a Q&A session. Then we'll jump back into some more content for about 10 minutes, talking about team building and, and team development. And then we'll end with another Q&A session. Also, I want us to acknowledge that there are many different teams on this webinar. As it's now, I think we are already are more than 100 people attending. I think that's actually my cap. I didn't upgrade it <laughs> to allow for more people. We had about 250 people who registered for this. So what, what we need to know is that there are many different teams on this webinar. And you might be in a team that's part of a startup, and there's five of you in the entire business, and that is your team. But you also might be part of a corporate and you are part of Exco and there are many different teams and in the organization and you might be sitting on many different teams. And why I tell you that is because depending on the kind of team that you have, there are going to be different complexities and nuances. And obviously I won't be able to address all of them during the session. And speaking of complexity, no one knows the answer to how do we create modern teams for modern times? How do we create modern leaders for modern times? What we are all doing, everyone who is uh, a thought leader, anyone who is writing about this, anyone who's working in the space, is that we are taking our best estimated guesses on what we think people need to do, what they need to equip themselves with. And the reason I can tell you that is because we've seen management fads over the years come and go, and we are all trying and just feeling our way through the dark. And I want you to know that because it also gives you permission to try and to feel your own way through the dark and to fail and that that's okay. And that none of us have any of the answers, but we can all collectively try and just figure it out as we go. So all of that said and done, let's jump straight into uh, talking about virtual team building for virtual teams. I think at the moment we are going through the biggest remote work experiment in history. Uh, guys, I just want to check in the chat. I have the chat disabled at the moment, um, just so that I can focus on the presentation. Um, I'll come back to this right at the end. So 2.1 billion people are currently in lockdown across the world. Um, and that's absolutely insane. And of course, not everyone is doing remote work during this time. Many people don't have that luxury. But for many people, this is now their new reality, is we have to figure out how to do virtual work. And if I remember correctly, I saw Microsoft Teams logged 2.7 billion minutes in one day, uh, I think somewhere, somewhere in April, 2.7 billion minutes. And that's absolutely insane. And what I've seen is that most teams are actually very underprepared for what has just happened. Because what they found is that virtual work is a completely different beast. It is more complex. It has more, uh, it's, more, it's more complicated than simply taking what we used to do offline and now doing it online. And so for many teams, they are thinking, well, we just need to tolerate this. We just need to get through it. 
And so they are seeing what we are going through as a pit stop. They are thinking, well, once we get back to the office, once things return to normal, we'll go and figure out this whole team thing. But in the interim, like we'll just carry on. We'll just we'll communicate at whatever uh, cadence we need to. We'll uh, suffer through virtual work. But this is going to blow over, and we'll get back to the way that things always were. And this is the absolute worst thing that you could be doing for your team at this time. If you are here, then I hope that you've already committed to the detour. I hope you've already made the decision that you are going to do virtual work, you are going to be a virtual team, and that you are going to be the best possible virtual team that you can be. Because if you don't do that and you sit in the pit stop, every other team who has made that decision, who has made that commitment, will overtake you. More than that, I hope that if you are sitting in the session and you haven't yet made that decision, that you haven't yet made that commitment, that you leave the session today making that commitment. Because ultimately, there are so many upsides to virtual work. There are numerous studies that show us that when your team becomes more virtual, not only is there increased productivity, there's increased focus, but you also have the ability to hire from anywhere in the world. And I think it speaks to a very important human value. And that value is autonomy. You know, when like Dan Pink told us years ago that people want autonomy, mastery, and purpose. And for many people, when they go to work, to the office, they feel like they're stepping into a prison. Like they are being monitored every single minute of every single day, and there's no time to actually do the things that are important to you personally. So when you get to work from home and you have the autonomy, the control to direct your own day, to decide you know, where you're going to spend your time to run some of your own personal errands. This way of work really appeals to you. But what's missing is that remote work doesn't fulfill another very important human value. And that value is belonging. We know that since the dawn of time, people have wanted to meet around the fire. We've wanted to find our tribe. And it just so happens that where we typically find our tribe is at the office, the people that we work with, because they are the ones who, in, who are in closest proximity to us and spend the most amount of time with us. And so having said all of that, I don't think that the future of work is purely remote. I think there are going to be many organizations that thrive remotely. And it seems like software companies take to this much easier than most other companies. But I personally believe that the future of work, the future of teams, is to embrace hybrid vigor. Teams that are as adept at working online as they are at working online, uh, as they are at working offline. And hybrid vigor is a term that was actually introduced to me um, when I adopted this pup. <laughs> so of course he's going to be part of the presentation. He's always part of the presentation. So his name is Axel and. Uh, we adopted him about a year and a bit ago. And when we got him initially, we thought he was a Belgian Malinois because he had this very dark face and he was very, very skinny. And after a bit of time, we thought, well, let's do a DNA test. Let's actually like nail down exactly what kind of a breed he is. And what came back was that he was a Malamute, Alaskan Malamute cross German Shepherd. And when I spoke to the trainer about this, she said, very often what happens is that when you have two different breeds um, and you crossbreed them, there's this phenomenon known as hybrid vigor. And essentially what that means is that the offspring adopts or, or inherits some of the best traits of both parents. So in his case, he's a German shepherd, but he doesn't have the sloping back that typically goes with a German shepherd. That's been bred out of him. He has a straight back, which means that he probably won't be as predisposed to things like hip dysplasia or some of the common things that German shepherds are affected by. And that's what hybrid vigor is. It is how do we take the best of both worlds, best breeds, and put it together? And so that to me is going to be my call to action for you, is moving forward from today, how do you cultivate hybrid vigor in your team? And you have been given the perfect opportunity to work on 
becoming the best possible virtual team because you have no other option. But if you are stuck in the, in the pit stop, if you are thinking of this as a temporary situation and what you actually want to be is a in real life team, then you are missing out on the opportunity to cultivate hybrid vigor. Because once we get out of this, you are going to have the teams who just go back to doing things the way they've always done it. And you're going to have teams who have embraced this idea of hybrid vigor and they have an entire new range of working available to them, an entire new skill set. And there's no way that the team who has adapted both, that they don't outpace, outrun, outgun every other team. So, of course, there's also many downsides to remote work. And they, they, they kind of stand in stark opposition to many of the positive things. So we know that loneliness is quite a big thing. Um, depending on the source that you, that you get your information from, loneliness is reported by about 30 to 70% of people working remotely. Um, I've been working remotely for about five years, and I can tell you that it's definitely something I've experienced. And you don't just solve it by going to the coffee shop. Because loneliness isn't just about having people around you, it's about connection. But there's also disconnection from um, the people that you work with. There's also lack of motivation. There's also the distraction of having kids run around you when you're trying to work. I've been working with many teams and I've asked them to send me their challenges and I've gotten lists and lists and lists of challenges that they are facing. A quick, very interesting side note, something that I was reading yesterday. I don't know if you've ever played with VR, but like the, the real high-tech VR. What's really interesting is when you put it on, it, it really feels like you are stepping into a new world, into like, it, it just, it's, it feels so real. And then, you know, depending on the simulation you might be running, um, they have these sort of roller coaster ones or the train ones, but anyway, there's movement in the, in the simulation. And I've always found that I can only last for about 10 to 15 minutes when I do it, because what's happening is your brain is interpreting all this movement, but your body is standing still. So there's this weird disconnect that happens for your mind. And for me, that results in nausea every single time. And I was reading yesterday that Zoom is actually doing the same thing to us, that there's this real disconnect because we are seeing people on a screen, but they aren't there. And so in our minds, something is just not gelling. And that then leads to the disconnect as well. It, it sort of contributes and, and um, enhances it. And so that is where team building comes in. And that's what we want to speak about today. Because team building gives you the opportunity to then address many of the things that your team will be feeling and experiencing during this time. But the very first thing we need to do is to talk about this phrase, this term, team building. I've been on a mission for the past year and a half to get people to think differently about it. Because when I say team building, what is the very first thing that pops into your mind? And maybe just pop that into the chat box quickly. I'll quickly pull that up and see what is the first thing that you think when you hear the word team building. Let me know. Trust falls. Ah, oh, Andy. Fall backwards into your colleagues' arms, group activities, go to a conference and have fun, drinks, awesome. Guys, I mean, it's like, it's like you scripted this for me. I really appreciate it. When we think team building, we think we go away for a weekend, we have drinks, we play these silly little games, and then we get back to the office on a Monday and we get on with work again. And I've been, uh, we, so when we think team building, we think cringe. That's, that's what I think when I think of traditional team building. And I really believe that traditional team building is broken. And yet we still go and do this. We, still, we pay a lot of money to go and do this, in fact. And the reason, I mean, there's, there's many ways or many different things to say about this, but the reason why I think team building is broken, two quick reasons. Number one is we lack directness. So what we do is we take our teams away from their context, from the office, from the meeting, and we go to some remote location, we do some work there, and then we get back to the office on a Monday, and then we think, well, like none of the skills that we worked on has pulled through. And the reason for that is that there's no directness. And this word comes from Scott Young's book, um, and the book's called Ultra Learning. And it just means that, you know, if you want to be a better golf player, what, how do you get there? Do you go and read a book about golf, or do you go hit golf balls? 
if you want to be a better leader, do you watch more TED Talks or do you go and lead people? Like, obviously, we know that doing the thing makes us better at doing the thing. So what we see is we take our people away. We have them build spaghetti towers in the name of innovation, collaboration, and leadership. And then we get back to the office on a Monday and we're like, well, where's the innovation? Where's the collaboration? Where's the leadership? And the reason you don't see that is because that isn't the skill that you actually worked on. What you actually did is you created a team that's better at building spaghetti towers. And I can prove that to you because I would take your team away again the next weekend and we get them to build spaghetti towers again. And what do you want to bet? They're going to be better and faster at building spaghetti towers. So the context in which we develop and build our teams really matter. Now, what I'm seeing and what's actually quite frustrating is now what we're doing is we're taking all these little games we used to play before offline and we are porting it online and we are calling that virtual team building and virtual activities. Do me a favor and at some point, not now, go and Google virtual team building, virtual, virtual um, team building exercises, virtual team building activities and look what you find. And for most of it, you're going to see that your cringe factor is going to be pretty high. Like some of the exercises I've seen is that you uh, get everyone in your team to send baby photos to the facilitator or to the manager who's going to run the meeting. And then in the meeting, before you start, and this is a real virtual team building exercise, you go through all the pictures and everyone has to vote, you know, who do they think this picture belongs to? I mean, I, can, you, can you imagine that that is a way to build a virtual team? It, it definitely isn't. Um, and when I, when I evaluate these exercises, I always think, Number one, how would I feel if I was involved in this? And number two, do I think it's going to be effective and actually built into the team in any way? And I can't see how baby pictures contribute to the team. Um, but there's so many others. There's one where you spend the first five minutes having a dance-off. I mean, I can't imagine any exco or management team wanting to spend the first five minutes in a dance-off before they get to the work. There's pen pals, there's online fitness, there's like all these weird little games that you get to play. And I really hope that we stop for a moment and just try and reimagine what virtual team building should be. And that we don't just take the offline games we used to play that people hate, that are cringeworthy and try and bring it online. But so in a very long way, way number one is we lack the directness because we play games instead of building skill. The second thing that I think contributes to the brokenness of team building is that it is time blocked. So how does team building typically happen? Well, we wait for things to break down. We uh, get to the point where our leadership team isn't where they need to be or accountability has completely fallen off the boat. And then we're like, okay, we need a team building to go and fix this. And then our language is like, let's go and do a team build. And what that implies is that team building happens from Friday to Sunday. There's a start and an end date. And then we get back to the work. And I think that's fundamentally broken because team building is a process that never stops. And if, if we continue using this language, what's going to happen, what's already happened is that people think that team building is this once or twice a year activity that's either based on tradition, we do it because we've always done it, or we do it because things are broken. And that when we are done with that, we are done with team building. And language really matters. And the way we think about this really matters. And so I'm, I'm on a mission to reclaim the word team building because I love it. I think it's such a strong word. And I think it really speaks to what we are trying to do, but not if our understanding of it is that we go away and we play games and we come back on a Monday and we get back to work. I was speaking to a very seasoned uh, learning and development practitioner. He's been with uh, major, major brands over the past 24 years. And he said to me, just call it team development. And I said to him, yeah, sure. Like that is, that's one way of doing it. But I actually want to fight for this word. Even if it means team by team, I get them to think differently about team building. I'm okay with that. I don't want to just take the easy way out and, and rename and reframe this. I want us to use the same word, but know that it has a different meaning and a different way of approaching it. So, if we then say that traditional team building is broken and that we don't want to just port it exactly the way it used to be to an online version of it, what does it mean? 
Well, I think it means that we have to have certain conditions in place, certain ways in which we are going to create everything else that follows in terms of how we um, build our team. And the first condition then is that team building is a process. It is ongoing. It never ends. It is not time blocked. It is something we engage with over and over and over. The second condition is that team building, the, the cornerstone, the center of it is learning and development. And learning and development, so developing the team or developing the, the individual, also gives us moment for connection and for bonding and for having deep conversations about what might not be working in our team. But it needs to be at the center of the team building that we do. I think we are pretty good at uh, focusing on our personal development journeys. So every year we sit down, we say, who do I need to be in order to achieve what I want to achieve? And based on that, we script out a little plan. And that plan is known as a personal development plan, a PDP. But I don't think we bring that same intention to our team. We don't sit down in the beginning of the year and say, who does this team need to become? What does this team need to become if we are to achieve the goals that we want to achieve? And that's a really good question to actually start with. And then the third condition that I think is important is that we have to move from team building activities, team building exercises to team building rituals. This again speaks to the fact that it's a process, but it also speaks to the fact that we have to have certain activities that repeat that. And so that they're not once off, like we're not doing this, um, in the beginning of the year and then that's it we're doing the same ritual over and over and over and we know that through repetition and through iteration that's how things get better so i wanted to start talking about team building activities and rather talk about team building rituals i actually uh, i absolutely love that idea so i'm going to pause here for a second what we've covered then so far is really that at this stage you have to commit to the detour you have to commit to this new way of working. And if you come out of this session today thinking, I want to create the best virtual team that I possibly can, because even if we go back to normal, we would have cultivated hybrid vigor and I'll have a team that is as adept at working online as offline, then great. That is a, an amazing first um, point of departure. The second thing then would be to think, well, team building isn't just playing games. Team building is something that happens all of the time. And a very easy way to think about it is, well, who does this team need to become? What does this team need to become? And have we even had that conversation with our team? And that's kind of the point where we've gotten, gotten up to is, well, this is kind of how we need to think about virtual team building moving forward. So if you have any questions, um, I'm going to take a, a quick break here and answer any questions that you might have. Um, you can pop it into the Q&A box. Uh, you can pop it into the channel. Completely up to you. Um, what should great process or rituals look like? So I'm gonna cover that next, Josh, and I think it's a good question. And ultimately, I think the most important ritual is the one that the team derives on their own. And it's, it's the function of asking big questions like, who does this team need to become? And I think once we have a, a big question like that and we have input from everyone on our team, then we can start thinking, well, what does the ritual look like? And I'm gonna share it three rituals with you that I think you can implement with your team straight away. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately, the team needs to co-create those rituals. Uh, let me see if there are any other questions. I'm going to stand still here for only a few seconds. Uh, do you think the team building differs for big teams versus small teams? For sure. Um, there's definitely a big difference. You know, when I talk about the dancing, for example, I, I'm not saying that there's no utility in it because I think traditional team building does have certain elements that contribute to building a team, teams having fun together, really important. But ultimately, um, I think it's important. Yeah, it, what you're saying is right. Like you, you need to know whether you're working with a, an Exco team or whether you're working with a team that's still really small, very fun. Um, it, it all depends. It's kind of why I put the disclaimer at the beginning. Um, are the process and rituals specific to particular industries? Um, it might be but not necessarily. Um, that's the most vague question of my most vague answer I can give you there, Jock. Um, just a quick one. How do you think this new move towards remote working will impact the virtual assisting industry? 
and how do you think this will overly affect small businesses and access to quality teams? Um, you know, ultimately, I think what this allows us to do is, so if we talk about virtual assistants specifically, I think it'll probably be a, a quite a booming industry moving forward because what, one of the cornerstones of virtual teams is that we get to interact with anyone in the world. We get to tap the biggest talent pool that, that's available to us. And the more we integrate with this, the more we'll realize that we also need to tap into virtual assistants. Um, and I, I mean, a virtual assistant is part of a team, right? Like, depending on what kind of clientele you work with. Um, how does one manage? Sorry, guys, there's so many questions. Um, I'll, I'll have a bit more of a relaxed uh, answering session towards the end. Um, how does one manage resistance from leadership regarding virtual working? Uh, I actually had this exact discussion this morning. Um, I had two team coaching sessions um, and obviously everything I'm doing at the moment is regarding virtual teams. And I was in, he, was, he was asking regarding clients because uh, how do you get your clients on board with a virtual way of working? And I think essentially here's what's going to happen. You are either going to make the jump and you are going to be excited about the prospect of building hybrid vigor into your team and, and embracing a virtual way of working or you are going to lose completely, or you are going to be dragged into it. And there's just going to be no way for you to really um, avoid it anymore. And I think to a large extent, what we've gone through now has shown us that we have to speed up the process of digitalization. But I think for many people, you know, if you are really stubborn about this and you don't want to embrace it, at some point you'll just be dragged into this future. And if that's the case, like, why not just make that shift now? If it's going to be as painful later on as it is now, then just go through the pain now. Um, I often say that human beings are excellent at tolerating mediocrity. And I come back to that over and over because I think it's true. We, we would rather suffer in the long run than just suffer the inconvenience in the short run and just get things done. And where I often relate this to is I used to work as a, a physiotherapist in another lifestyle, in another life. And we would always have patients come in who had a hip, who, who needed a hip replacement. Um, so they would have a fall, they would break the hip. And then when you come in, we x-ray both hips. And what you typically find is that the other hip is also degenerated because of osteoarthritis, which was typically the sort of the leading cause for the fall anyway. And the doctor would say to them, listen, um, let's do this hip. It obviously needs to be replaced. But then once you're back on your feet and you know six months, 12 months down the line, come in and let's replace the other hip while you're still young, healthy, even though it's not a problem, let's just replace it. And then you'll have 20, 30 years on your new hip. And if you don't do that, there's really three things that are going to happen. Number one is you're going to leave the hip. It's going to get painful. You're going to become more and more immobilized. And one day it's going to be so excruciating that you need to get it replaced. So outcome hip replacement. Number two, as you leave it, the pain gets worse. Um, the bone degenerates even more. And one day it becomes so brittle that you're walking and while you're walking, the hip just snaps and you end up on the floor, outcome hip replacement. Or number three, as you leave it, uh, the pain gets worse, you become more immobile, but the proprioceptors, the cells that help you to balance, also degenerate. And one day you're walking, you lose your balance, you fall, and you hope that the only thing you break is that hip and not also dislocate the other hip or injure your spine or whatever the case may be. And what do you think most people do? They leave it. They do nothing because they'd rather suffer for the next 10 years on a mediocre average hip than suffer the inconvenience right now of just going through the process and having a good hip. So we have to remove the things that make us weak. And I think in many cases, that's also gonna be team members that can't adopt to a new way of working. And I know that's very harsh to say, but unfortunately that's part of the way that, uh, that the world works and the way that business works. So, okay, there are many more questions. Uh, let me move on for now because I, I can feel that I'm rushing and I don't want to be rushing you guys. So let's slow down again and let's talk about team building rituals. So specifically, three team building rituals um, that I want to run you through. And these are like, if you, if you had to ask me, can you please work with my virtual team? Where do we start? there's many places to start, but where I would always start is with the meeting because we used to have really bad offline meetings. Now we are really having, we're having really bad online meetings. And so in the meeting, there are a few spaces, a few opportunities 
to do things better. So the very first thing that I would recommend, the very first team building ritual, and I want to just frame this again for you, that team building is not about fun games and about um, entertainment. Team building is about building the team, right? It's about how do we create more connection. It's about how do we improve performance. It's about how do we function better as a team. That's what we're trying to work at here. Like we always have to come back to why do we do what we do. And so that's what I keep in mind when I, when I work with teams as well. So the very first thing is to do a check-in. Now, this is quite a common thing that you'll hear. And I was speaking to an entrepreneur yesterday and he said to me, you know what I, what I always used to love is um, I'd get to a meeting five minutes before and we'd have a bit of a chit chat and then we get into the meeting and that's part of how I build relationships. But, you know, with Zoom meetings, we just kind of jump straight into the meeting. We're like, what do I do? And the check-in is an opportunity to actually create a bit of rapport in that sense. So there's many ways to do this. Um, how I like to do it is I like to, to get team members just to check in with how they are feeling. And it sounds kind of weird, but it's actually quite liberating to know going into the meeting, what is the state of mind of your team members? Like what kind of headspace do they find themselves in? And so the typical check-in might just be, well, um, you spend 30 seconds to a minute per person. It's one-way communication. There's no crosstalk. And each person just gets, each person just gets to say, well, how are they feeling? I'm feeling frustrated because of X, Y, Z. I'm actually in a really good space. I'm excited, X, Y, and Z. And for me, that's typically enough, but you can also combine that with another question. And that question will completely depend on you. You might want to say, you know, what has been your biggest challenge for the week? Um, what is something that you're working on? What is exciting you at the moment? But you could also theme it, you know? So if you are meeting on a Monday, you might want to say, well, okay, the first part of the question is how are you feeling? And the second part is what did you get up to for the weekend? And what this does is two things. It gives you a bit of a peek into the lives of people that you don't interact with all that much, that you only see on a screen and only with their specific background in the back. So it gives you a bit of a, an insight into what they are busy with. But perhaps more importantly, why I really like it is that it also gives you the opportunity to have your teams back. Because if someone checks in and they say, you know, I'm actually feeling really frustrated at the moment, as a good team member, as a team member who has the backs of other team members, you should be going after the meeting and saying, listen, you were saying that you're feeling quite frustrated. You want to have a quick chat about it. And that is the moment where you get to build connection, where you build empathy and understanding into your team. So we can't just jump straight into the work every single time. We have to also check in on the people that we are working with. And I think this is a great way to do it. You also combine this with a check out at the end of the meeting. And the check out for me, again, you can, you can kind of customize this how you want to. But for me, it's again the same question. How do you feel? And what is your accountability going out of this? And sometimes it's really just, you know, what have I taken from the meeting? What has been a highlight for me? Um, and sometimes it is, what is the action that I'm accountable for next? What I, again, love about this is that what I often see is that someone checks in at the beginning saying, you know, I'm feeling really frustrated. And by the time we get to the end of the meeting, they say, I'm excited. I'm inspired. And it's such a great thing to see and to be a part of because it feels that even though we are there to do the work, we have also just, as a team, helped one of our team members to move to a different state of mind. And, you know, human beings want to be of value to other human beings. It's just inherent in us. And it, it, it just gives a meeting such a great feel when we bring that into the conversation. Now, you don't have to do this for every single meeting because not every single meeting is the same. But I would definitely do this for all your, all your big and important meetings. And um, as a quick side note, one of the teams that I work with, um, they used to meet once a month and now meet every single day and they do this check-in every single day. So I think it's, it's worth your time spending five to 10 minutes upfront, quickly checking in, where are you? How are you feeling? And you know, it, it, it's the, the gateway for further interaction down the line. So that's team building ritual. Number one, team building ritual. Number two is just, I'm just calling it fix the meeting. Like I said, we, we tend to have inefficient meetings. And there's so many great things that we can do to make meetings more effective. But 
very often the way we hold a meeting is either based on, you know, we've always done the meeting this way, or perhaps you've inherited a certain structure in terms of how a meeting runs, or perhaps you've even gone online and you've seen what people recommend and you've tried to implement that into your team without really paying attention to, is it working? And so fix the meeting for me really is to build a post-mortem assessment into some of your meetings. And this doesn't have to be every single meeting, but at this rate, during this transition phase where we are trying to figure out what does the virtual team look like, you might want to do this every single week, have a, a 10 to 15 minute session at the end of one of your meetings where you ask, how did this meeting actually go? Was it effective? Did we communicate well? Did we get distracted? And you allow your team to co-create what the meeting looks like. So when I was working with one team, what, uh, what we ended up creating for them was duos. And this was completely by their own design. And essentially what happened is, I think they're a team of about eight, is that during the meeting, when there were certain points that were up for discussion, instead of everyone just chiming in or going in a round robin way or free for alling it, we would break out in duos in, two, in teams of two and they would discuss it first, pick each other's brains, challenge each other on their thinking, and then come back into the meeting and then they can have a free for all or then they can report back what the duos were saying. And I think that was such a great way of taking the normal standard meeting and making it more effective. And now on Zoom, you can do the exact same thing. You can have these breakout rooms. So your meeting doesn't have to be the same as it was before. You don't have to port it, bring it from the offline variation to the online variation. Fix the meeting by creating a post-mortem with your team and asking them, what could we be doing better as a team? And then you try it, you know, for the next week you, and don't make a whole list of things, like do one thing at a time, implement one change at a time, try it for a week, see how it went, do another post-mortem, what needs to be fixed and tweak. The one thing that I'm, I'm still trying to just find the, the proper language for this, but I want teams to be iterating quicker than the software that they are using. I love the idea of that. I just need to still phrase that succinctly. But you know, when we're working with Zoom, like you often see Zoom has pushed out a new update. And I want teams to be in that same mindset. Like now that we are virtual, let's see ourselves as virtual teams and let's push out these updates regarding to how we function as a team. I, I love that idea. So that's team building ritual number two. Team building ritual number three is to actually invest your time having different kinds of meetings, different kinds of sessions with your team. And I call these a ritual just because I think we, for now at least, we can have these recurring over and over and over. And you can almost run them in succession and then start at the front again and you'll see what I mean. So the very first type of session you need to be running is an impact session. And an impact session really just says, what is the impact of COVID on our current business? And that is gonna change from day to day, from week to week, depending on the kind of business that you're in. And it, it's really important that everyone is on the same page. Um, again, depending on your, your business, you know, if you're a small business, small team, it's quite easy for everyone to be on the same page. If you're a much bigger business, many different arms, many different silos that are existing in your business, it might be more difficult. And so having an impact session where everyone gets aligned, everyone knows what's happening, really important. Second session is a future session. And a future session is really just where, what are, all the trends that we are seeing, how might they impact our business? And again, like we don't really know what the future is going to look like. And I've been reading a ton of future like trends and reports. And what I find is that it just helps me to be a bit more creative. It helps me to think about where might the world be moving. And I think the more we explore that in our minds, the more we might be ready for whatever the future, wherever direction it goes into, because we've created these scenarios for ourselves. The next session is a new business model session. And in that session, it's all just about what does the new business model look like for us? And everyone has to come with ideas and suggestions and we get to brainstorm it. And again, there is no way that you are going to do this effectively if you are seeing this as a pit stop. If you commit, if you haven't committed to the detour, then doing a new business model session will be useless to you because it'll be half-hearted. Um, there'll be no commitment to it. This is a great time to be doing this, but only if you're committed to the detour. So the first three are, are, are mostly business related. The next three are mainly people related. The next session is a support session. And a support session's only goal is to support the people that are in the team. What I've been suggesting to many teams is to actually create a virtual suggestion box. And what that looks like is a shared document, whether, you know, whatever kind of tool you want to use for that. 
And then as the team goes, they update this list with the challenges they are facing at, at, at home, you know, and you might get to a very long list of distraction and lack of motivation. And you'll have every single um, challenge that your team is facing on one piece of paper. And when you jump into these support, se support sessions, you can then talk about the challenges and how we can resolve them and how we can support each other to resolve them. The next one is a development session. I happen to think, and not only because I'm a coach, that learning and development is, it's a great time for team building. It's a great time for team development because it just so happens that when our foundations are shaken, when everything seems to be crumbling, that this is a great time to rebuild and to rebuild in alignment with who we want to be and the values that are important to us. And then the very last is a teaming session. And the teaming session is literally just thinking, well, how are we working as a virtual team? And it'll include things like the meetings, it'll include the communication cadence that we have, it'll include uh, trust and accountability, and we get to talk about all the things that are important to teams. But this is simply a session. It's not about the work, it's not about what work do we do, it's about how do we do it. It's about how do we as a team come together. And so what you could actually do is you could run these sessions one after the other, and you can almost just keep rotating through them. Um, but of course, it, again, it completely depends on the kind of business that you are in. But I quite like this um, as a short-term ritual, at least for now. But I think long-term, many of these sessions we should be having as an ongoing process. So that's really it. Those are the, the three team-building rituals that I wanted to share with you. Um, the last one that I want to share with you is one that I've been running with teams personally. And this has been my best attempt to try and support as many teams as possible during this COVID crisis. And it's something I call team talks. So team talks is a, a, mish, a mishmash, uh, like a, a mashup of three different things. The, and I'll take you through this and you understand. The one is TED talks. The one is team coaching and team building. And the other is Netflix. So let me quickly explain that to you. What happens with team talks? And I, I did two this morning, by the way. Um, how it works is every single month, I sit down with your team virtually for an hour. And for 15 to 25 minutes, I present some of the latest research insights and some of my experience around working with teams. And so obviously a very pertinent topic at the moment is virtual teams. And so that's the content that I've been delivering to these teams. That is the TED Talks component of it. For the next 15 to 25 minutes or however much time is left in the session then, we talk about what does this mean for your team? And I think there's two really important things that emerge. The first is that we have a shared language and a shared understanding of content. You know, I always think that it's great that some people are so into reading books and watching TED Talks and all of that, but it doesn't really help if only one person on the team understands an idea. We can hold each other a lot more accountable when all of us understand it, right? When all of us have this shared language and all of us have this, the, the shared understanding of an idea or a topic. And of course, what's really important is that we then drive towards a behavior that when we have interacted with the content, we have thought about it in terms of the context of the team, that what is the behavior that we are taking from this that we will implement? And then the Netflix component of it is that it's a subscription, so you sign up for it every single month. But on top of that, you get every single training. So you get it in audio, you get it in video. And over time, you build up this entire library of trainings that your team can go and listen to, that they can go and rewatch, and that is really bespoke and in the context of your team. And I think that's really important. I'm not going to try and hard sell you on this at all. Um, that's not the intention. I wanted to create this offering so that more teams can slot into team coaching at this stage, because team coaching traditionally is really expensive. Um, and what I'm charging for this team talk session is almost the equivalent of what I'm charging my individual coaching clients. Um, it's slightly more than that. And pretty much the only reason I'm doing that is so that it can reach as many teams as possible. Um, and that's it. I'm not going to hustle you at all. Uh, if you want more information on that, if you want to chat to me about it, you can, get, uh, can reach me at eric at modernbreed.team. So thank you very much for, for joining me today. I see we've actually hit 45 minutes. 
I'm happy to answer a few questions, um, but if you want to log off now, then feel free to do so. I'm really happy to see that um, we are still pretty much at capacity after me speaking for 45 minutes. Thank you for that. Um, this will be available as a recording as well. And I'll be doing more virtual team webinars as well as we go along. Um, so I'm going to jump into some of the chats here and into the uh, Q&A. And again, if you want to uh, pop off, uh, I won't take any offense. Thank you for joining. And please feel free to reach out to me if I can support your team in any kind of way. Um, all right, so let's jump into some of the questions. Let me see what I can find. Thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Uh, cool, so if you have any questions, pop them into the question box for me instead of the chat, just so I can see it. Um, Frank, so are the principles for high performance team building uh, while remote? Yes, they are, but I think some of these, some of these um, principles are quite universal, you know? Some of the things that don't change when we are building teams online is that we still need things like trust and accountability. Um, we still need to cultivate um, interpersonal relationships. We, so we still need the bonds. You know, so many of the things, many of the principles that apply to offline teams apply to online teams, but how we go about it is different. So for example, like when I think of trust in a virtual team, I'm still, I'm still crystallizing this for myself a bit, but when I think of trust in a virtual team, it's different than the trust in an offline team. And I'll tell you why I think so. In an offline team, much of how we feel about someone creates trust. You know, it's the feeling that we get, the, uh, the in-person feeling. Whereas I think online, what trust actually looks like is dependability. Is, can I trust you to go and do the work and to deliver on what you need to deliver on? And that you have the team's back, you have our best interest at heart, and that it shows in the actions that you are taking, that you show up for meetings, that you are dressed up. I have this big thing about people showing up for meetings in their boxes. <laughs> That's why I think people should just do um, video calls. I think that, you know, at least we get to see you. And there's some teams who, for example, would do a pants check. You know, again, like, I think that small little funny ritual, but it, it sort of builds into the team over time. But Ultimately, I think, um, so I actually asked my friend, I thought there for a second, what was your question? Oh, so just to, to recap, I think there are many universal principles for teams that apply, whether it's online or offline, but I think how we build and how we approach some of it is going to be different. One of the things I've been saying for a while now is that um, what, what really tripped me up initially was that I always... I always got caught up in this thinking, well, it's just not the same. So I was doing team coaching online and I would get off the session. I'd go, ah, you know, it's just not the same. Like the feeling isn't the same. The energy isn't the same. And then what switched for me one day was it's not supposed to be the same. It's actually supposed to be different because it's a different medium. And as soon as I made that switch in my head, it just became so much more enjoyable. And so I think, you know, virtual teams aren't the same. Many of the principles are, but let's approach it in its very own and unique way. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Otherwise, I think that is it. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, let me see. Thanks, Colleen. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Evan. Uh, cool, guys. So I think I think that is pretty much it. Uh, I'm not going to hang around for much longer then. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, please, please feel free to reach out to me at eric at modernbreed.team or eric at ericruger.com. Uh, I'm happy to just give you some advice over email. I'm happy to engage with you regarding team talks. You name it, I'm here to support you. Thank you very much and have an amazing day.